Well, Google Plus has certainly put a wrench in the Edge of You show tonight. I know all of you are expecting that we run an 8 o'clock show, and we always start at 8.10. So tonight <laughs> we started at 8.15. And by my clock, it's like 8.41. So the Edge of You girls do not disappoint. We are always guaranteed to be late. This time, <laughs> however, we're going to blame Google. So thank you for all of you who decided mm -hmm. to wait it out with us. We have been working very, very hard since about 8.05 to try to make sure that Edge of You was going to go on air tonight without a glitch, and we failed miserably at all of that. But we're really excited tonight. Um, so as you know, Edge of You, all about talking hot topics and trending things happening in education. Tonight we were to have two guests. We are working really hard to get Michelle Cooper with us tonight, but um, at this point I don't know if Google is cooperating. You'll notice Kat Flippin is also missing. She is, she's working on it, and I sure hope that she can join us soon. But we're very, very excited because we do have Nikki Robertson with us today. And, Nikki, we are, we're just so excited to talk to you tonight. We want to hear all about TL Chat. We put a wrench in the end of you show tonight. I know all of you are expecting that we run an 8 o'clock show. We all Yikes. That was me. Okay. <laughs> That's all right. So, Nikki, we're really excited to talk about TL Chat with you tonight. We're also talk excited to talk about the future of libraries hashtag that I just learned about yesterday. But before we get into any of that, we want to know all about you. So, t tell everybody, Nikki, who are you and all things about you. <laughs> well, um, my name is Nikki Robertson. I am a 21 year education veteran. Uh, mainly working in libraries. I've worked eight years in elementary libraries and eight years in high school libraries and before that I was a fifth and sixth grade teacher. I'm also co-founder of EdCamp Atlanta along with the wonderful Jamie there and we're getting ready for EdCamp Atlanta to come back for a second time around on September 14th. Very exciting. If you're not familiar with EdCamps, please make sure you look up EdCamp. Just type in EdCamp into the search box and find an EdCamp near you. If there isn't an EdCamp near you, do like Jamie and I did and start your own. <laughs> Cat's here! Yay! Hey, Kat. I don't know what the heck is going on, but this is messed up. <laughs> it's all well, good. We have to say for, for Ed Camp Atlanta, Cat Flippin is the uh, backbone of that app we have. She yes. is, and it's currently so being updated and recreated. So if you're like, this is a little outdated, that's why. But it should be going live end of next week, actually. Mm -hmm. So excellent. Mm -hmm. All right, so hot topics. Kat, I imagine you have a hot topic you want to throw out real fast. <laughs> uh, did we already talk about Google Hangouts? <laughs> um, well, I, I introduced it by saying um, <laughs> it wasn't really going very well. <coughs> it was it, very strange. I mean, it, it, this has never happened before. It froze my Chrome browser, getting uh, trying to get back in. For some reason, my, hang, my Hangout completely froze, so I had to close it, and then trying to get back in, I got the notification, froze. I have a Mac Pro. So I don't really know what happened. So yeah, but I mean, Google, we like you, and we love the updates. And they're very pretty, but there's always kinks, I guess. But other than that, um, oh well, I'll tell you, let you guys know. Uh, the foreign language department at Mount Vernon is going completely digital. Ooh. Yes, where we adopted wow. officially Middlebury Interactive, and all we have no textbooks. There's nothing that will be handheld, even the language lab portion. Everything is submitted online. Wow. So, yeah, paperless rocks. Very cool. What about you, Stacia? What hot right. topics are brewing? Uh, for us, it's the transition from first class to Gmail. So Ooh. it was a really crazy time to do the transition because we're just finishing up exams and then summer school starts in two weeks, and we asked our faculty to have a an email-free weekend. Oh. <laughs> so <laughs> that one's going to be tough. Um, but we're excited. We're very excited. And as you all know, Chris Kraft, who joined us on Edge of You a few weeks ago, he's our consultant and he's helping us with the transition. So we we're very excited. can't have anybody better. Yeah, I know. Be a, such a huge resource for your school. Yeah. And if anyone's ever transitioned from first class to Gmail before, I'd love to hear your comments about how that went, especially for faculty who, you know, I just can't imagine people who don't use Gmail, but I guess I'm just a, an adopted digital native. <laughs> so. Um, just seeing how that works and then the other thing that's going to be a little tricky is that we already were a Google at school so we have a love it like SCH account but now we're going to have just a love it.org account and so now having to recreate calendars because we oh. use calendars for everything and transferring sites and ownership of documents so that's going to be the next thing that's going to be tough to get kind of you know people kind of used to so 
We'll Good luck. You'll do it. I think so. I know. Well, tonight we're really excited. Um, Nikki, is, oh, you, you are for sure a wealth of knowledge when it comes to media resources and, I mean, comes to everything, essentially. But specifically, of course, when it comes to media resources and teacher librarians and you're, I mean, you're just, you're certainly a wealth of knowledge and so we are so excited to talk to you. Kate is not able to be with us tonight. Kate has um, a daughter graduating from high school Yay. and so what um, I'd like to lead in with Kate and I have had a lot of discussions lately about how schools obviously, um, besides Forsyth, in Atlanta anyway, there's really not an opportunity for schools to have a technology integration specialist in every school. And so how do you combat that? And so Kate and I have very recently oh, had this. Show. Yay. So Kate and I have very recently had this discussion about how important we think media specialists are because there are media specialists in every school and how important media centers and media specialists are going to have to be in a world where we just aren't able to put those types of positions in place. So Nikki, what, what is your view on, on the future of libraries, which, uh, you know, I just discovered the hashtag, but what is your view on that role in the future of libraries in educational technology? Right, definitely librarians and school libraries need to be the hub of the school. The librarians need to be the leaders in the latest things that are going on in education. When I first started as a librarian in 1997, there were no IT departments. We were just kind of running uh, internet connections just like you would do in your house and computers were just getting put into the schools and we were it. We were the tech people who had to go, oh wow, okay, let, let me figure out how to do this. And I just really fell in love with it and have gone from there. Um, but I see that sometimes there's a disconnect between the technology department and library and they really need to be working hand in hand with each other. They need to be supporting each other. And then for those smaller school districts where you might not have a very big IT department, because I've worked in a school district before where there were only three IT people for the entire school district, there's not going to be somebody in your school who's going to be able to help. Uh, the teachers and the students with the technology and that's where you really need to as a librarian step forward and be that leader be the one who helps integrate the new technologies into the classroom make sure that you, your teachers your administrators and your students know this and I really don't see another way of doing it than being connected and building a great PLN because I owe everything I am today to my professional learning network and so I would say the most important thing is to start getting connected and I started getting connected with the wonderful uh, teacher library uh, virtual cafe. If you look up TL Virtual Cafe, started with uh, webinars, monthly webinars, the first Monday of every month at 8 p.m. And you can find all of our archives there, our recordings, uh, gamification is something we've talked about a lot, which I know Kat loves. We also talk about Common Core, how librarians can support and help implement Common Core. Also, lots and lots of collaboration and educational technology discussions. So definitely take a look at what's going on there. You don't have to be a librarian just to go to the teacher library virtual cafe because it's for librarians and teachers and how we can all work together to support our school. That's wonderful. Michelle, can you hear us? No, I thought our mic was working for being... All right, Michelle, go up to the little gear in the top right-hand corner and make sure that you've set up your uh, microphone and camera to see, see you and see if that works. Mm -hmm. Or I tweeted you my phone number. Give me a call and I'll walk you through. <laughs> okay. All right, girls, I have a sad story to say. I'm afraid that, unfortunately, in this new world of Google Hangouts, the people can post inappropriate things on our Hangout links. Um, so unfortunately we've had our first negative and inappropriate post. Um, we will work to get that off as soon as we can. Um, so please know that um, if you are doing Hangouts that obviously once they're made up, we've never had this happen before. Um, so I'm going to work to get that off, but just know that obviously um, inappropriate things are being posted um, on our page right now and we are certainly working to get that off as soon as we can. Okay. All right. So I think Michelle is back. Let's try her. Can you Michelle? hear me? We can. Yay! 
I made it. <laughs> Yay. Thank goodness. Okay. Well, I'm glad to be here tonight. Thank you all. I'm so glad I made it with all the technical difficulties I've had. We We're are all you. with you. <laughs> Michelle, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Is that where you wanted to go, Jamie? Yes, yes. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm going to try to get this nasty stuff off our site real fast. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm a librarian in Henderson, Texas, which is East Texas, if you're not familiar with it. And um, this is my seventh year, and I absolutely love it. It was what I was born to do. And um, I'm just having a blast every day. And I think that we're in a uh, a great time right now with the technology and everything. Librarians are, it's kind of, I, I call it like a little golden era right now because you have the chance to reinvent yourself and to see all the new things that are coming and um, you know just be an asset to your school. I think that we, we really have an opportunity to kind of not just redefine ourselves but show the community you know everything that we can do you know to help the students and teachers. Tell them about the Texas Librarian Chat that you um, co-moderate. Um, every Tuesday evening from 8 to 8.30, um, we have uh, the Texas Librarian Chat. Um, because we love TL Chat so much, it had so many great resources, and it was such a wonderful professional learning network, we decided, why don't we band together as Texas librarians and share resources? So a friend of mine, Sharon Gullett, and I tossed back the idea. So we started it, and then um, we have five other awesome moderators with us. and. We have been doing it um, since the beginning of April, and we have had awesome people be our guests, and we've had wonderful topics. Tuesday night, uh, we had uh, Nikki on there talk about branding and her beautiful new library, and um, so we've just had a blast with it, and it's been just a great opportunity to, you know, like I said, share resources, because a lot of the times you're the only librarian in your school, and so it really gives you a chance to uh, collaborate. Well, thank awesome. you so much. Oh, go ahead, Stacey. Oh, I love what you said about reinventing yourself. Um, I'm sad to see our middle school librarian go, but we hired a new one who's very tech savvy. So, how would you? I guess what are some things that you would start if you know if you wanted to build a new relationship with the technology specialist and the librarian? Like, what are some things you could start looking at um, to really have a true partnership and have them work together? Um, well, in my situation, I am extremely fortunate. We have a brand new tech director, uh, Kevin Bryan, who is awesome, and we have, um, you know, a lot of teachers who have really jumped on the bandwagon of tech. Of course, we have some, you know, that are a little more hesitant about it, um, and I think that's where my, I think that's really where uh, my role comes into play. I started a Tech Tuesday program a couple of years ago. Uh, with a, a fellow librarian and every Tuesday and also on, it grew so much we had to add Thursdays and I would give them a 30 minute lesson something short that they could do um, you know they could master during that time and they can play with in a you know a non-threatening environment and uh, kind of show them you know how they could do this with their lessons and then my um, principal we were fortunate enough to have him, you know, if they went to the Tech Tuesdays and got, um, learned the tools that they could get comp time um, for that, for attending so many sessions. And it's really been, I really think it's changed our campus quite a bit because I see kids come in and they tell me, I learned how to uh, make an infographic in this class, you know, and I'm like, oh wow, we just did that in Tech Tuesday a week ago, and so it's really awesome to see the teachers teaching, you know, taking it out there and teaching the kids and, and using it, and so I think that's been a big step is uh, collaborating with those teachers and, and showing them that tech is, is not scary, that it's fun, and you know, the, te the students have so much to teach us as well, you know. So um, I think that I've just been fortunate in my situation, but it's something anybody could start or do at their school. Right. I learned about Vine through the kids, and then uh, they taught it to the teachers, and they've been using it ever since. Um, also, I taught my teachers about Google Plus Hangout, and that just went over with gangbusters. Um, 
not only for the classroom, I had teachers record their lessons for the flipped classroom using Google Plus Hangouts, but I had teachers who started doing tutoring sessions at night with Google Plus Hangout for those kids who have band and sports or after school jobs and can't stay after school for tutoring. They did late night tutoring uh, through Google Plus Hangouts and had a hashtag on Twitter to take questions from their students. And so I was really thrilled when our teachers took what I taught them in our coffee chats. That's what I called my sessions, our coffee chats and gave them coffee and donuts and things like that. And that they took it as far as they did. I'm really proud of what our teachers were able to accomplish. That's really awesome. That we haven't really had that big of a leap onto Google Hangouts with our teachers, but that's incredible that you guys can do that as, you know, I guess that they actually paid, I guess not really pay attention, but take you guys as both media specialists as well as, you know, technology integrators. I guess in my experience in public schools, that has been entirely separated. So we've had our media specialists, then we had our local school technology coordinator, and they didn't really do much together. So it's really nice to see that there's a collaboration going on or switching. There's even someone who does all the positions. That's really awesome. Right. It, it's really exciting to get into the classrooms. I like to do co-teaching with my teachers as well. Those who are a little apprehensive about using new technologies. I'm like, don't worry about it. I'll coach you one-to-one -one or I'll come uh, co-teach a class with you. And I've done that. And it's fun because first block... I do most of the teaching with the new technology. Second block, I'm like, okay, where do you feel comfortable taking over? And by the end of the day, the teacher is pretty much teaching the entire course at that time. And so, and then they're like, well, this is so easy. I don't know what I was afraid of. And I'm like, yeah. But so being that hand there to hold the teacher's hand, to know that they have something to fall back on, you're that safety net. Mm -hmm. And as long as they can see you as that, then that's great. And if your technology coordinators aren't tapping into the great resource of librarians, they are missing a gold mine. Mm -hmm. So they really need to go into that library and say, hey, what are you, what's your expertise? What can you help with? Mm -hmm. Well, I just want to say, um, while there are some awful things being posted um, on our page right now, Sue Fitzgerald from Justin, Texas. Um, has said that she is watching and she is loving the wealth of knowledge that's being shared. So um, I am so happy to have something good being posted on there. Um, <laughs> just an update on that. If I'm flagging spam like crazy and it doesn't do anything, it leaves it. So Google, if you're watching, we need to figure out how to stop those things from happening. Um, for sure. But Sue, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, ladies, another question that I have um, is that the learning space as a library mm -hmm. um, has, I think, from what the standard deviation has been, certainly is changing, to say the very least. And we had um, Tim Clark on um, a few shows ago, and one thing he mentioned was that um, in Forsyth, Joe Hobson had a, a very big push towards that changing environment. Um, and so not just maybe the people in the environment, but the environment as a whole, so the physical environment of the library. So what do you see as a changing physical environment in the library as time goes on? We're relying more on ebooks and we have more of a balance of, of print and ebooks and digital things happening. What, what changes do you see in those libraries physically happening? Well, um, I'm, I'm fortunate this next school year I'll be moving to a brand new school. It's not even done being built yet. I had to wear a hard hat and boots. Uh, a few weeks ago to go uh, view my library, but it was in very much skeletal format. I really, the blueprints are a little bit better to, to see what's going to happen there, but the space is very different from a traditional library. It's more of a um, cafe type setting, even though it doesn't have a, a cafe inside of it, but more of a cafe setting, much less shelving. Um, more room for technology, computers, and not your desktop computers, but laptops where the kid can pick those up, walk around the library, go where they need to within the library. And so one of the things that we were discussing with the Texas Library Chat this past Tuesday was branding and coming up with a, with a different type of brand than just it being a library. Um, that's one of the things my new principal tasked me with was, okay, we need to brand this thing, but I don't want it to be just a library. And I don't know if he understands that there isn't just a library. Libraries are these <laughs> fabulous things but <laughs> that encompass more than just books. So I came up with... Um, 
Tech, which stands for Thunderbird, which is our uh, mascot, Thunderbird Empowerment and Collaboration Hub. And I kind of really like the ring of that, and so working on that logo now, because I think that that's really what the library is. It's a place to be empowered, whether you're a teacher, a student, or administrator, and to collaborate. A student with student, teachers with teachers, or teachers with students, or administrators with students, all the combinations above, where everything comes together in that library and everybody can collaborate and empower each other to be the best that they can be. And so that's really uh, where I see the libraries um, going and the message that we should be conveying. My opinion. <laughs> no, that's a great opinion. Have you had difficulty making that tra transition? I'm thinking of like people who are a little more traditionalist when it comes to libraries, and they still like the not necessarily the card catalog back in the day, <laughs> but uh, you know, just there's there's a stark lack of books that are you know more less and less books are being checked out, and right. people are like, well, libraries need to still exist. Do you still have do you have some feed like some, not some feedback, but um, some backlash to that, or are people kind of generally okay with the change? You know what? I think they're okay with the change. At first, when we got ebooks at my current school, uh, a lot of the kids were like, "Oh, I don't like ebooks," and the teachers too. But once they tried them, they were like, oh, "I can't believe I've, I haven't been doing this." Or, or, you know, for Christmas or whatever, they got Kindles or whatever, and then they were like, "Okay, I have this thing. I had to use it." And now they're like, "I can't live without it." So I really think that getting an ebook program is is something that librarians need to look into if they have already done so. It is a, you know, it's not a solidified environment at all. You have publishers who, like uh, Harper Collins, who after the book's checked out 26 times, that book disappears from your collection. Mm -hmm. Well, if I have the same book on my shelf and it gets checked out 26 times, it doesn't magically disappear that 26th time. And so these are some issues that are being have to be worked out with publishers, but I just don't think that we can take a back seat on getting started. And that's another thing really great about your PLN and these great librarians like Buffy Hamilton who blog about their experiences because you can learn from other people's experiences. She had started off with buying Kindles and then ran into a lot of issues with the licensing of the books and the Kindles and being able to pass those out to students. And so you know, I chose a different way to go with my ebook program based on things that I'd read from my PLN. I didn't even know that about the Kindles that there is a licensing issue. Can you elaborate more on the issue that you experienced? Oh, it uh, it was Buffy Hamilton in Georgia, okay. and um, I'd had to go back and review her blog, but I know there were some issues there. Um, we basically went in Auburn went with Overview mm -hmm. and we went with Overview because our public library had just adopted Overview Overdrive, I'm sorry, yes, Overdrive. Yeah, Overdrive. <laughs> I was like, what am I talking about? Overdrive, uh -huh. the public library gone with that. So we wanted to um, piggyback off the public library so that the students would have access to both the public library and our school library and it wouldn't be a completely new system for the community to mm -hmm. learn. Um, in my new library, we're going with the Follett ebooks. Okay. Yeah, we use Overdrive as well. And I'm wondering, do you do you have access? Well, not that I'm asking for data. Sorry, I'm researcher alert. Um, <laughs> but do you, are you able to see how frequently kids check out books, or like, do you have data you can collect and see how it's going? Yes, definitely. Awesome. You, yes, you can do that. And it's good. I was really surprised when we first got Overdrive because I was worried about how it was going to go over. And then I looked at the stats and I was like, wow, they're, <laughs> they're checking out these books. And then I had teachers come in and say, I just put this book on hold. Why can't I have it now? And I'm like, it'll come to you just as soon as it can. And we also discovered that getting the audiobooks are very uh, are an important component to that ebook collection. Our teachers and our students both like the audiobook component. Um, some of our teachers said, I love to listen to the book while I'm exercising. It makes me keep going when I might have given up before with my exercise because I don't want to stop listening to the story. And then there's those students who want to read, but they have a difficult time reading. Um, for instance, a friend of mine is dyslexic. She is very intelligent, has a specialist degree, but reading is very difficult for her. So when she wants to read a book, she usually gets an audio book. Mm -hmm. And I find this with students who have difficulty reading. 
doesn't mean they're stupid. They just have a hard time reading, but still want to enjoy those books. And so definitely don't just get um, the ebooks. Make sure you get audiobooks as part of your um, ebook collection. And Sue chimed in and she says she loves ebooks in the library, and students have gone viral with checking them out. Yes, yes. They so, do love it after they get used to it. So, Nikki, does that mean you guys allow uh, students' personal devices on campus, or are they checking these out from home? Well, in Auburn, we did allow student devices on campus, but there was not a BYOD um, officially in place, but our principal allowed the kids to bring it, and then it was up to individual teachers how they use those devices in the class. They weren't allowed to connect to any of our wireless, so they had to have their 3G or 4G to do that. I do know that in my new school, um, the kids are going to be able to, at least what I understand, students are going to be able to bring their own devices and should be able to hook up to our wireless. Mm -hmm. And it's supposed to be a very innovative, cutting-edge school, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to leave Auburn and go to this new school is because of the fact that they're so cutting-edge and it's going to be just a brand-new start. And something new for me to experience as a librarian. I've never opened a brand-new library from scratch before, and so before I retire, you know, this is just one more experience that I wanted to make sure I got under my belt. You look way too young to be thinking about retirement. <laughs> Girl, I'm a grandma. <laughs> oh, no, no way. I haven't been 21 years. You can retire in uh, Alabama at 25 years, so I've got four more years. <laughs> um, I guess a question about the e-books, and tell me, how have you seen, like, for instance, kids who have accommodations, how have they adjusted? I know, like you said, the audiobooks are great. But what about kids and even teachers who still like to mark up their books? And so, like, when you check out a book, you can't really mark it up and do all of those kind of things. How have teachers and students adjusted to that? Well, the crazy thing is you actually can mark up, and that's what our teachers and students have like. Matter of fact, I've got my, I've got Kindle and Overdrive and Nook and all sorts of things on my iPhone and my iPad, and I've just been reading the latest David Sedaris book and marking passages in there, mm -hmm. and you can bookmark, you can highlight, and then when you highlight, you can actually uh, share what you've okay. highlighted to Facebook or Twitter. Um, you can save it to your instant notes and so forth. So there's that's a lot right. more interaction, and, and that's one of the reasons my teachers were, were more resistant to ebooks. They were like, I like to write on it or mark things, and I was like, You can do that. Look what I can do. And they were like, Oh, I didn't know. And so, yeah, they do really like that. So, even for the books that you check out, like if, if they expire after two or three weeks, you can save those notes. You can save, I believe you can save your highlights because what I've done with mine is exported those highlights out into a notes. Awesome. You can tell I don't do much with ebooks. <laughs> Get on it. Get on I it. I will, love it. When I I'm standing in line, getting my oil changed, waiting in the doctor's office, I just pull out my phone and I have a book to read. It's yeah, so nice. <laughs> Well, I was excited. Um, Y'all know I did the iPad Pilot um, for eight weeks, and the, they, so of course, added the 60 iPads. Well, in addition, um, they added, um, I'm not exactly sure of the amount, but about 20-some Kindles. Um, there's a, a reading program where the kids um, compete in a, in a reading bowl. Not exactly sure the details, as you can tell. But the kids were going, the kids that were on this team were going to get to take home those Kindles this summer. So they were going to download the book that they were going to be able to read for this reading bowl. And so the kids were going to get to take those e-readers home this summer. And then another portion, the, what didn't go home with the kids was going to stay in the library. So I really liked that because I thought, you know, in a school where we're, we're adding iPads, Obviously, those apps exist, but um, very much liked that, in addition, um, they were adding these e-readers for the library, and um, so I thought that was really exciting. Definitely, and everybody approaches it in a different way. Um, Auburn, we didn't provide the e-readers for our students because over 95% of our students had their own devices that they could use. In a different school district, um, the one I was at before Auburn, we might would have had to provide e-readers for those students because it was probably opposite flip. So it really depends on your, your school and your school district and the needs of your students, how you approach e-readers. We're in the process of flagging a lot of spam. So we're, <laughs> we're multitasking, and so we're a little, a 
a little quieter because we're it's coming in pretty hot, hot and heavy. So I don't know. Does that mean that we're like official girls? If we're, maybe. If we're like officially getting spammed. So maybe maybe we've made it. Maybe we're looking at this all wrong. Oh, wow. Maybe we're now official. Right. I mean, even in, with this one, you know, maybe it's that cool that we're talking about e-readers. <laughs> they just heard that Nikki was going to be here, and Nikki is yeah. that right. awesome. Yes. Yes. Right. All right. right. Is Michelle still with us? Michelle, are you still with us? Yes. I'm, I'm here. I'm good. Okay. Well, Michelle, I I just recently left Texas, and I certainly know that um, Texas is a hotbed for instructional technology and a hotbed for you know new and trending things. So, what is happening in Texas specifically um, that that you can report on? Because you know, it ha if it happens in Texas, it'll happen everywhere else. So, <laughs> so what is Texas doing that we should, probably should prepare ourselves for in the world of libraries and the future of libraries and media? Well, I think uh, I think a lot of the things that you've mentioned, um, as far as uh, we are BYOD this year, we have Bring Your Own Device, and the students do love it because they can uh, put books and they don't have to haul around as many books. They like that. Um, but it was it was a transition getting them started, like Nikki said. Um, but yes, the iPads um, we checked out. I think seventy six this year to students. Um, like Nikki said. I would say uh, we did a, a survey and 95% of our students had a device, um, but we bought devices and, um, or we got a grant for devices, sorry, and um, checked those out to those that needed them. Um, and that worked out really well this year. Um, you know, maker spaces are big right now um, and all the technology yeah. that goes with them. We yeah. are having some. Uh, makerspace nights in July at our high school and inviting the community in um, for some different things and I'm really excited about to see how that's going to go. Yeah, makerspace is the big thing and with design. We just talked about design thinking last week or no, two weeks ago with uh, Mary Cantwell and the uh, makerspace and kind of goes in with that as well and that's what we're thinking about um, when it comes to redesigning our media center because we're figuring out how exactly should something like this look. So we want to provide the materials necessary for people to be able to use it as a makerspace, but that's a little challenging. What, what it, can I ask? Like, what kind of materials are you putting in there? Is there anything in particular that you guys are providing to make it more of a makerspace? We are we are setting up a maker area that will be <laughs> which will be a permanent area, um, and we're just. Anything from scrapbooking to Legos, uh, just anything you can imagine. Kids are bringing me Legos from home. Um, origami is big. Um, not to mention, um, you know, the BYOD. They can bring their technology and they can create things and they can create their own, their own, um, you know, eBooks. We have a creative writing class that's been doing that. So anything from like low tech to high tech, and I think that's the beauty of the library is it's just a space for all those creative juices to come mm -hmm. out. And I love when Nikki said it's the hub because it, it truly is. It's really the heart of the school to me. And you know, anything I can do to encourage you know creativity, um, I get excited about. Well, That's funny you say that. We we were just talking about that today. Makerspaces. We're actually researching some three D printers. Um, we already have one, but we're looking at some other ones to compare, and having those in different pockets around school so that kids can come in and tinker and create. I, I think that's wonderful to have a three D printer. We're we're not there yet budget wise, but um, I think that I think that's wonderful. And I agree with the hub. When I first started the um, iPad Pilot, you know, as a new staff for me, I didn't really know them. They didn't really know me. I had to build relationships plus in the same time figure out how I was going to inspire them to utilize these iPads. So I really one day just parked myself in the media center and I sat in the center table in the center of the media center and I just sat there. And the funny thing was as people were walking in like I found that in the hallway they would say hi and keep walking but it was almost like since I was in the media center they felt a need that they had to kind of talk to me a little bit and so I really I, it was like seriously like the breakthrough for me because I just parked myself I didn't sit in an office I didn't I just I said no I'm gonna park myself in the media center and everybody has to walk through here at some point and it really did. It was like the media center brought out conversation in them and all of a sudden they would see me and think oh I gotta talk to her about 
something technology wise and they would and so I really feel like you know that you saying it was a hub is it's so true because it, it does it sort of brings out that we need to work and collaborate in here kind of feeling <laughs> and mm -hmm. that's awesome yes and one thing I did this year to really get to know you know the students incoming was I decided to create Library Lady who goes to the cafeteria on Fridays and checks out books with her iPad. So I'm in all these crazy costumes. Last week I was a robot and you could only imagine. Um, but you know, it was it's so much fun because they they actually they're ready to talk to me and then we can check out books. But then if they're having trouble with their device, you know, they can talk to me about that and things we have. So, you know, that's really been fun is just going out and, and like you said, building a relationship with them, you know, finding out who they are and what interests them. I would that's love to see thing. some pictures. That would be amazing. Go to go to Michelle's blog. You'll I see I will, I will. <laughs> Yes, they're they're all there. The good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> <laughs> That's the great thing, though, about blogging. Again, is other librarians can learn from you. And Michelle had said earlier, sometimes you're that only librarian in your school. Mm -hmm. And I've been in systems the entire time I've been in libraries where I'm the only high school librarian in the entire district. So I really have no one else to collaborate with on the unique aspects of being a high school librarian. Uh, so connecting through my PLN with other librarians has really been a blessing to me because otherwise I'd have no one but my own brain to go off of and you know <laughs> there's only so much in here and you know I say two heads are better than one but a thousand's even better than two and mm -hmm. so it's just this such a great learning community and if you can get your teachers too to plug into that because you know, again, sometimes your teachers, they're the only ones in the school who are teaching their particular subject, or there's only one or two others, but if they can connect with other teachers from around the world that are teaching the same thing, the ideas just abound, and they bring that back to the classroom, and the students, in the end, always benefit. Mm -hmm. Yes, I want to second that, because Nikki sent out this awesome picture on her blog earlier of this um, these forensic books and she had gotten a student or someone to sit down and they did a, the tape around him like a crime scene and that <laughs> tr truly inspired us to have our own crime scene and that's all it took was her inspiration. Yeah, she, uh, Michelle got her forensic science teacher in on that and set up a whole mystery that they had to solve. Is that correct, Michelle? Yes, we had a great time. We had crime scene tape, QR code clues. It was lots of fun. Awesome. Well, you think so, about yeah, bring the library to life and make it relevant to all your different subject areas. Yeah, I mean, you think about how the library was when we grew up. You know, it was just such a different environment. It was going, yeah, exactly, go in, not really quiet. I still, to this day, I will tell you, I have no idea how to work a card, card, card catalog to this day. If you put me in front of a card catalog, I'd say, mm, it's me. Um, so, I mean, if you just think about that dynamic and how different it is, um, I think that there's, you know, there's so much to be said about how much of an integral part it is to the future of education, hands down. Right, definitely, definitely, and and the shame is that right now libraries all across the nation are on the chopping block. In yeah. Alabama, we just lost all of our library aides, which is a horrible shame. We need our library aides, but then there's um, some districts in Florida and in New York where they've completely lost their libraries and their librarians, and I think we're going to see the same backlash that happened when we got rid of PE. That went away and came back when we realized, oh, we shouldn't have gotten rid of PE. That happened when we got rid of the arts in school. Yes. And they realized, oh, why'd we do that? That's crazy. And so now I think people realize PE and the arts, you can't get rid of those. You can't get rid of your core classes. Where can we cut? Oh, libraries. Who needs a library? Nobody reads a book anymore, which is so not true. But right now, we're the, we're the favorite child to be on the chopping block. And... And we're seeing a lot of cuts across the nation. And in school libraries count report, it's been proven over and over again that schools with strong school libraries perform better on standardized tests than those without mm -hmm. libraries. And I think we're when you start to see these cuts going across the nation, you're going to see a massive drop in test scores. That there's just no two ways around it. Mm -hmm. It's so unfortunate. Mm -hmm. 
No, I totally agree. I think that it's just that we're this we're at a strange kind of I guess changing point where people are still viewing libraries as these old entities and they're not really understanding what it is as a new entity, which the new entity is actually really integral to, you know, to educating these kids, especially with, you know, how it's becoming this amazing space and everything you can do with it. So I, I, I totally agree that, that this should not be chopped off at all. But it, like you said, two or three years, they'll be like, oh. <laughs> <Whoops."> <laughs> like, why did we do that? <laughs> I know. But education is always behind the time by two or three years, as all of us know. So one day they'll, they'll catch up. It's a roller coaster. It will be back. It really, and it's always been like that. If, you've, if, if anybody's actually ever studied any educational history, it is literally just this pendulum that constantly goes back and forth. There's never an even, an even keel anywhere. Mm -mm. So, well, and both of you work with older kids, so I guess um, you know. And then Cat will probably start rolling her eyes. She go, there she goes with that <laughs> elementary stuff again. Um, <laughs> but you know, you know, I think that it's really an important thing to think about. You know, kindergartners come in, and and these elementary media centers and these elementary libraries, you know, they are as important. <sighs> And if you think about the roles they play as any other place in the building, because if we're talking about a, building a foundation of reading and literacy and learning, that's where it happens. Um, so yeah. I just think that you know it's a it's just sad that that isn't a valued resource in education because uh, you know obviously we want to hit all age of kids, but I mean if you think of those little ones, I mean that's 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 their beginning. That's their start. Right. I loved when I uh, was an elementary school librarian. I love both um, areas for different reasons, but oh boy, those kindergartners, they were too precious. And then, you know, watching the first graders go from being beginning first graders to where they, they still weren't reading really well to instead of you reading it to them and they were so proud of themselves and then those second to third graders moving into chapter books it's an exciting time and so important to have those libraries for those little ones plus you know introducing the different technologies to to your students as well um, I, I have a grandson who's two and a half years old and every time he sees grandma it, he knows the iPad's going to be there or my iPhone and I've got his games on there and I don't even have to tell him what to do. He knows what buttons to press, he knows where to go for his games, he knows what game he wants and you know at two years old he knows all his letters, his numbers, his colors and, and everything so you know technology is fabulous and you really need to start connecting as young as possible. Mm -hmm. And speaking along those lines, I kind of envision this new role as a, as a media specialist or, uh, you know, the, the techno technological librarian um, as someone who can really be the, uh, the voice for digital citizenship and teaching digital responsibility, especially starting out with the young kids. I'm not rolling my eyes, Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually a very valid point for elementary school because once they get up to the high school and they're not understanding, well, you know, why can I not post this in a public forum? <laughs> That's really something that should be taught when they're younger. I mean, for Michelle or for uh, Nikki, what are your opinions on that? Do you feel kind of like you guys could start that movement in your schools? Absolutely. I think, um, like you said, the younger the better. You know, the, as soon as you put it out there these days, it's out there forever, and they need to understand that and, and learn how to use it responsibly. And, and like, I, like you said, I think they should be taught early on. And um, one of my really good friends, Julie D. Ramsey, Jamie, do y'all know Julie? You and Kat? Okay. She wrote, um, she's a fifth grade teacher in Alabama in Fultondale, and she wrote, uh, one of the things that I love that she does with her fifth graders is she has a Twitter account for her class, and her students go up to her desk whenever they're doing something. It's all project-based learning in Julie's class. Everything's hands-on, hands student-centered learning. And so as they're working in class, when a kid is doing something they're really proud of or they want to share with their parents or with other people, they go to her desk, they grab the iPad, they take a picture, they write a tweet about it, and then they give her the iPad. And then Julie looks over the tweet to make sure it's okay and then sends it out if it's okay. If it's not okay, she'll explain to the kid, why don't we change this or this or this? And so she's teaching in action good digital citizenship. And so I know we might not want 
um, all of our a first grader having their own Twitter account or Facebook account, but if you could incorporate it the way that Julie has in her classroom where they're proud of what they're learning, where they want to share this with their parents, and their parents have that uh, hashtag or are following that Twitter account, then they can always get up-to-date information on what their kid is learning every single day in class. And what a great way to develop those community connections and those parental connections. Um, I just, I love everything about Julie D. Ramsey. <laughs> I'm her unpaid spokesperson. <laughs> yeah, I love that. I'm going to use that idea with my middle schoolers. So I think it's perfect, but then, you know, we've turned off social media on all our students' laptops, which is so unfortunate because what better place to teach them than in the classroom environment. Mm -hmm. So I totally love that idea. And, and you know, that's going to get me on my uh, soapbox. <laughs> I'm one of these... You know, I'm like, why are we as educators sticking our heads in the sand and pretending that social media doesn't exist right. mm -hmm. and blocking our kids from it instead of educating our students how to use it responsibly in a professional way? Because look at the headlines. Look at teachers who get fired within the first five years of working oh, because yes. of inappropriate yeah. social media or who can't get a job because they're posting the frat parties that they're passed out at online, they don't understand the impact of social media and why not? Because it's yeah. never been taught. Mm -hmm. So we're just going to not teach something that valuable and then stick our kids out in the real world? I'd like to say I don't think our spammers were taught digital citizens. <laughs> I'm just going to throw that one out there. They don't know any kind of citizenship. Shame on their schools for sticking their heads in the sand and blocking so social media. <laughs> yeah. Um, I wanted to ask about research since you guys are in the upper schools um, because you know I'm in a middle school and there are some teachers who still do research but you know now because they have all of these databases and everything's online again they feel like there's no need to get the librarian involved and so how have you kind of dealt with that in this age of research as well? Michelle are you there? Yes, I think I'm, there. I'm back. Um, okay. I think that uh, you have to really go out and, you know, advocate and show them what you can help them with. You know, I start at the beginning of the year. Every year I go around and, you know, what can I do for you? You know, this is what we have in the library. These are our resources, our databases. You know, what can I help you with this year and, and plan? And I think they start to see you as a resource. And today I had a teacher that I've admired for many years come in and say, I need something for the end of the year. We need to do, you know, this is the research I want to do. Let's do something with tech to make it fun and, and you know that thrilled me that they start coming to you as a resource and so I think it's just you know collaborating with them and, and letting them know that that you're you're there to help them you know I want them to come to I want them to come to the librarian first and you know copyright is still a big issue <laughs> yeah. uh, students think that just because it's on the internet it belongs to them <laughs> <laughs> I had a student who copied and pasted and then oh when the teacher said, this is plagiarized, they were like, I didn't plagiarize it, I just copied and pasted it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you still have to teach about, you know, oh, proper copyright and, you know, God, it's boring, but I've tried to make it just as interesting as I possibly can. We also um, need to teach about evaluating really good sources and what's the mm -hmm. difference between a good source and not a good source and the fact that just because it's the first thing that popped up in a Google search doesn't mean that that's necessarily what you need to use for your project. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Nikki. Thank you. <laughs> right? <sighs> so. Oh, and, and let's not even talk about Wikipedia <laughs> and teachers who you know, say, hey, it's okay to look at Wikipedia and use that as a source. <laughs> you can use it as a source for jumping off it, but I wouldn't have it be your right. qualitative yeah, source. And I'll be all right. Okay. Yeah, and, and then, too, with your older kids, what I do with them is, if it comes from an encyclopedia, even if it's an online encyclopedia, you shouldn't be using that in a research paper. You're too old to be using basic encyclopedia information. You need to search deeper. That is and so, so it's getting that deeper like that. <laughs> <laughs> And I tell them too, yeah, when they say, I can't find something, and I'm like, where did you look? And they show me the first thing they found on Google. I'm like, that's why it's called research. Because <laughs> you search over and over. And I, like that. I like that. Well, what, do you, 
Sorry, Sasha, go ahead. Uh, it might be the same question. What uh, tools do you use for citations? We use Noodle tools. Um, EasyBib is what I've been using. I love it because it easily integrates with uh, Google Docs. Yeah. I'm a Google freak, so. Yes, we use, we use EasyBib as well, and we love it, and the kids love it because um, they can create their portfolio and take it with them and have their account through college, and they can also have what they've done right. in, in high school. And one thing on the copyright I'll add to what Nikki said, one thing that really has started to um, make them realize the ramifications of copyright is, you know, during orientation, I let them create, you know, either using GarageBand or Audio Boost something like that they can create a little sound bite of music and I will say okay now I'm gonna use all of yours for different things and it's gonna be you know mine now and I'm just gonna use it and that really they really look at me like you're really gonna take this it's mine I just created it that really brings home you know, <laughs> the idea of intellectual property I love that living example that's great I'm gonna steal that <laughs> Steal away. <laughs> I'll credit you there. <laughs> um, my last question would be what um, what you believe the role is um, for teaching Creative Commons. Um, I think that you know that kind of hits on the same same vision. Um, I know one of the um, gifted and talented teachers um, that I worked with one day at school. I noticed she had the kids um, doing a blogster on research on um, some tribes they had. Um, they had been re researching and I saw the kids typing in like the name of their tribe and then it said for kids creative commons and I went oh my gosh that's amazing I had never seen I would never seen that even be a topic obviously in education we're fighting a lot of other educational technology battles so to see this teacher have already taught and they were second graders to have, have her taught her second graders and probably every other group that she met with that they needed to be searching for images that fell under Creative Commons was like massive for me. So I, um, you know, I'd like to know your thoughts on, you know, the importance of teaching Creative Commons, especially in this world where we want them to create, create, create. Right, and one of the things I, I do teach the students is how to check to see if, a, if something they're using is Creative Commons. And, you know, there's different types of Creative com Commons. And so you have to look into the the different details of the Creative Commons and whether you can alter that in any way, the image that you have, if you need to give um, recognition to a certain thing, if you can use it more than once. There's, there's different types of things like that. Plus, also, I've set up a Pinterest page for my school to be able to use that has um, Creative Commons sources for them to be able to use as well. Michelle, do you have anything to say about Creative Commons? Yes, I think it's important, um, you know, to teach them, and, and it just goes back to copyright and how we can share things, but we need to make sure that we give everybody the credit. And so I think it's just a, another great tool, um, you know, to show them and, um, you know, what they can do and, and also how to respect other people's work. So I think I love Creative Commons. Mm -hmm. Well, girls, believe it or not, we're coming to the end of our hour. Time flies when you're talking about awesome, amazing things. I know. So, thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Nikki, for joining us. This is such a valuable me. topic. And tell mm -hmm. us, uh, promote TL Chat um, and Texas Library Chat. Promote those. Tell us when those happen. Um, go for it. Right. Uh, TL Chat, uh, the via, uh, TL Virtual Cafe webinar series season finale is June 3rd at 8 p.m. Eastern Time and I will be moderating it. It will be about um, I forgot, Connected <laughs> Educators. <laughs> I'm in vacation mode, I'm leaving tomorrow. But, uh, um, connected Educators and that will be special guests on, on here as well as Yay! a couple of others. We have a little work to do before we get <laughs> yes, <everybody>. yeah. <laughs> You're going to throw me into panic next time. <laughs> tomorrow, <laughs> tomorrow, I promise. Right. And then um, normally the TL, TL chat on Twitter is the second Monday of every month. However, because it is the season finale, we're going to have a special TL chat on June 4th following the webinar series on June 3rd to kind of finish out the season and then we'll start back up again I believe in September for the new 2013-2014 season of TL Virtual Cafe. 
All right, Michelle, tell us about when and where your chat is. Uh, TXL chat is every Tuesday from 8 to 8.30, and um, we just invite everybody to come attend. Anybody who's a librarian or who loves your library is welcome. Uh, we have, we have a, you know, a different issue or a different topic every um Every night we've been on branding for a couple of, of topics, but also parent-teacher collaboration, how to collaborate with administrators, etc. So anybody's welcome. It's just hashtag TXL chat. Thank you. I, it was, I was quite an honor to be here tonight. I appreciate it. Oh, thanks, Michelle. Thanks for cooperating with us. <laughs> well, that is a wrap. Um, Edge of You will be back in two weeks. We do know who our guest is, but again, we're not telling you because nobody asked us that question on the hashtag last week. So if you want to know, and I promise you it's a big one. It's a big guest. You want to know. So now is your time. Send us a, a tweet and post the Edge of You hashtag, and we'll tell you who our guest is going to be in two weeks from now. So again, thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Nikki. And uh, join us again for the next Edge of You two weeks from tonight.